So we're going to go ahead and begin this evening. And begin with just like Rachel said, uh, we are so excited uh, to share a little bit about our program. I'm recognizing that this is really um, a webinar to share more about who we are, who we form, the process by which we do that. And then we will have a separate webinar um, next week um, to go through that application process. So to begin, um, it's really most important for us to share our mission. So the Marianne Remick Leadership Program forms transformational Catholic school leaders. And when we think about transformational Catholic school leaders, we are primarily a principal preparation program. We have gone and uh, really been focused on over the last 20 years on forming transformational Catholic school leaders. Um, but this also means that we have also formed principals who go on to take on archdiocesan and diocesan roles, president roles within schools. Um, but that is our, our, you know, the main goal of our formation is transformational Catholic school leaders. And we see this happening in order to strengthen Catholic schools in three ways. And we're going to dive a little deeper into each one. The first being the intentional community building. We are a cohort-based model, the integrated spiritual development. We are a uniquely Catholic school leadership program. And the, the third is through rigorous academic preparation for all of our REMIC leaders. So we uh, here at the University of Notre Dame um, want to be sure that you, uh, through this formation, that you, of course, spend time on Our Lady's campus. And so over the 25 months, you spend three summers here on campus, um, the first summer lasting about four weeks, the second summer lasting about four weeks, and then the last summer um, lasting about two weeks, which will culminate then in graduation, um, and then two academic years online. And what is unique about this is that in that formation, spending time here in the summer with your cohort, and then having that opportunity to really apply all the things that you're learning while still being a full-time employee within your Catholic school. And so as a result, we have people coming from across the country and world um, in order to become, you know, to the University of Notre Dame and be a REMIC leader. And we recognize that in that opportunity, um, there also might be some challenges as well. And so we see this formation in the summer being unique and distinctive to us because it gives us an opportunity to learn together. Um, but again, really recognizing that the, a good portion of the time is also away when you are still working full time in your school buildings. And this will culminate in a master's of arts in educational leadership from the University of Notre Dame. And so everyone graduates with that degree. Um, a couple of years ago, we made the uh, really smart decision. And I would say uh, just to even further uh, our depth of the way that we believe leadership to be from it being a master's of arts in educational administration to a master's of arts in educational leadership, um, because we believe wholeheartedly in the impact that a strong leader can have within a Catholic school, as well as a Catholic archdiocese or diocese. So the first thing is really around this intentional community building. Um, we believe one of our beliefs is that we are made for each other. And as I mentioned, one part, um, as you'll see here on the bottom, is really this cohort experience. Um, our REMIC leaders, when they're here on campus, we have cohort sizes of about 40 to 50 in every cohort. Um, and because of the size of it, but also to ensure some more intentional supports with one another, Every cohort is also placed within uh, smaller professional learning communities, and this is a way for them to work together in the summer, but it's even more important in the time that they're away. Each one of these professional learning communities is led by an executive coach, and so the executive coaches are experienced Catholic school and archdiocesan leaders from across the country. They are not part of our uh, full-time faculty and staff but are really meant to be uh, individuals that will walk with our REMIC leaders in the 25 months and beyond and to support them through uh, discernment, support them through their growth and development. And we really consider them to be an important part of our community because they come in with a wealth of experience but also with that slightly kind of being a bit removed from our program, they're also just able to provide insights that my myself as a as a faculty member, um, I'm not currently working in a school. I'm not currently working in a diocese, and we find this perspective to be super helpful for our remic leaders as they um, continue to grow, but especially as they continue to discern what those roles might be for them to be leading in Catholic schools in the future. 
Um, we, of course, have a full-time faculty and staff um, here that work at the University of Notre Dame um, who are here to support our REMIC leaders. And then every REMIC leader also selects a local school site mentor. And so this is the principal of their school. Um, if you are the principal of your school, you have the opportunity um, to seek a mentorship from a, an archdiocesan or diocesan leader. Um, but this person is, is really there to support you through the 25 months intentionally within your school building. Um, and so know that we really see this community not just as necessarily just the cohort, um, but really everyone that's involved, the program faculty and staff, the executive coaches, the school site mentors. And so when we think about um, the way that Remick thinks about your school community, we also consider your school community as part of our community as well. The integrated spiritual development, um, we believe that we are made in the image and likeness of God. And when we think about our program and its unique and distinctive Catholic identity, we want to be sure to name that this experience um, is not one where it's here are all the classes so you can get your master's degree and ensure that you um, are, seek, are able to seek licensure should you choose. And then we're going to take a couple of classes that have to do with being a Catholic school leader. Um, we see all of our Catholic school formation really being integrated throughout. And so it is integrated in all that we do, but we have also a specific integrated leadership course sequence that goes over the 25 months. We believe that being the spiritual leader of a Catholic school is so important, but it's also something that requires some time to really grow individually as a Catholic school leader. And then as well as within the community, we have multiple opportunities where we all gather um, for retreat. And there's a picture here of one of our retreats here during the summer. We also gather halfway through the year um, and just see a retreat experience as being one that many of our Catholic school teachers and leaders just don't have the opportunity to really be able to step back and reflect. And so we see this as part of our our. 25 months, but also just an opportunity for us to grow as a community. Summer spirituality is a big part of the summer experience, um, and we were able to celebrate Mass together as a community multiple times a week when we're here together, um, as well as just ensuring that every single one of our Remic leaders receives ongoing pastoral support. And so as you were as you know, thinking back to the previous slide, all of the individuals involved, um, whether it's an executive coach your on-site mentor, the program faculty, the program staff are all available to ensure that you receive ongoing pastoral support as well. We don't keep the Catholic part of our identity um, separate in any way, but it truly is when we say it's integrated. Um, it makes us who we are and we are unapologetic about it, um, but we do wanna be sure to just name some distinct ways that we keep that separate. We believe in ensuring that we have rigorous academic preparation. Um, our students in our Catholic schools deserve the absolute best. And so our preparation of our REMIC leaders is done in a way that we want to be sure that every REMIC leader graduates from our program and is able to lead any Catholic school in any Catholic school, archdiocese or diocese. And as such, when we think about the preparation, I already mentioned that integrated leadership, which is really around that spiritual development. But we see this happening in three domains or other domains. And one is around executive management. We know that it is different when you are leading a Catholic school versus when you are leading a public school. And so within executive management, there are aspects of uh, our program that include finance and human capital management, uh, school law with a distinct focus of what does that mean in a Catholic school context. Um, as well as then when we think about instructional leadership, when we think about that, we're really saying, how can I ensure that I have every student learning in my building when I am no longer the person in every single classroom? It's near, it's impossible. There's no way that we could ever think about uh, a REMIC leader being able to teach every single classroom, but to really be able to take a step back and think, now that I'm no longer, I'm no longer in the classroom, I am now tasked to make sure that every student in my building is learning. But as a lead learner, I'm also tasked with ensuring that every adult in my building is learning, every faculty member, every staff member. And then we think about our Catholic school culture. When we walk into a Catholic school, we want to be sure that our REMIC leader is able to see what makes this school uniquely Catholic. And it's not just because there's a crucifix on the wall. 
but rather our beliefs, um, our mission, the artifacts we have on our walls. How do we in ensure that whatever the mission of our unique Catholic school is, how are we living that out every day? And just to reiterate, as I, I started with this slide, to really remember to every single one of you is working in a Catholic school right now. And in that experience, we know that you have so many things that you could bring into the learning environment, and we really want to kind of continue to give that space to our REMIC leaders. But it's also, we want to be sure that every REMIC leader has the skills for when they're no longer in that school building, um, because the reality is um, we need more Catholic school leaders. And so we really just want to continue to emphasize that we're preparing REMIC leaders to be the Catholic, uh, Catholic school leader in any Catholic school across the country. So if you're in a K-8, you should be just as prepared to lead a high school. If you're in high school, just as prepared to lead a K-8. to And so when we say rigorous, we want to be sure to just also note that this is to ensure that you can lead any Catholic school. We believe that we are disciples with hope to bring. Uh, this picture is all three of our cohorts together at the start of this summer. Um, and when we think about being a disciple with hope to bring, to also recognize that although you are part of a cohort, a single cohort when you are in REMIC, you're also part of a broader REMIC community. And so at the start of the summer, we have three cohorts together. And then halfway through the summer, um, the third year cohort graduates. But to really just recognize, too, that this opportunity to really interact with one another and more importantly, learn with one another as we pray together, um, as we have meals together, as you all live in a dorm together, um, is really one uh, that when we think about ourselves and being really on fire about our Catholic um, faith, as well as our commitment to Catholic schools, that this summer experience is one that really um, inflames that. And, and just speaking uh, quite transparently, um, and even just talking to Remick leaders today who are in their first year, one of the things they said is how much they still feel uh, their hearts on fire about what they experienced this summer, but more so because they were just able to interact with so many people from across the country and world who were also on fire about being part of a broader movement. And so when we think about that, it's important to also just explain a little bit about how we fall into this space. So if you think about it, uh, REMIC is a program and REMIC is part of a larger institute. I'm just gonna help you here. So when we start small, we think REMIC, one single program. We are part of a broader program called the Alliance for Catholic Education. And you might have some familiarity with, the, with ACE broadly. And so we have a teaching fellows program. We have English as a new language program, the program for inclusive education. Um, and so just to think that REMIC first and foremost, you have your REMIC community. And we have about 500 plus REMIC grads across the country. When we take kind of a step back from that, we have a broader ACE community, and that ACE community has lots of support and resources for Catholic schools across the country. When we take a bigger step back, then we're also part of the Institute for Educational Initiatives, as we call it, the IEI. And this is connected um, to not just programs that, of course, are for people that you know, aren't living here full time, but we also are part of now a supplementary major for undergrad students here at Notre Dame in education, schooling, and society. Um, we have the Global Center. Um, we have a STEM center. And so it's part of a broader space. But then if you even were to take a step back, still being part of the University of Notre Dame. And we want to share some of the spaces and just to kind of think about once you are a graduate of REMIC, you're also a graduate of ACE, and you're also a graduate of the IEI, and you're also part of now the University of Notre Dame's broader family. Um, and so our alumni network, um, which is one of the top 10 in the country, um, you are, I'm sure, have encountered another Notre Dame grad in a conversation. If there's anything we love more than our experience in Notre Dame is talking about our experience at Notre Dame. And to just consider that as a REMIC leader, you will also be part of that broader Notre Dame alumni network. And in that broader Notre Dame alumni network, you're able to network with people across the country and world. Um, but it also then gives some opportunities for you to um, get some additional support while you're here as a student. And so both in the three summers when you're here on campus, as well as your two academic years online, you're able to um, have access to all of our health services, um, any of the social and emotional support services we have for students. 
academic support services, um, campus ministry support services. And so during those 25 months, many of the ways that we seek to support students who are here full time on campus, you also have access to as well. And then upon graduation, of course, being part of that broader University of Notre Dame uh, alumni network, which has clubs across the country um, and, and the world who we know would uh, welcome definitely another Notre Dame grad into those spaces. Some dates, um, as well as getting just prepared for that applications. Um, as Rachel noted um, at the start, we will have a separate webinar for us to walk through that application together and ensure that you put your best foot forward. Um, our application opens uh, this weekend, October 1st, and then it is due February 1st of 2023. The three requirements um, is one, that you have a bachelor's degree from an accredited institution. The second is that you have full-time employment in a Catholic school as of fall 2023. Um, most of our REMIC leaders serve in Catholic schools in three ways. They're either a full-time teacher, they are the school leader already as a principal, and then the largest uh, kind of bucket are people who are teaching as well as leading part-time. We also sometimes have people who apply and have you know, been accepted in our program who might come from a bit more of a non-traditional uh, role in, within a Catholic school. Maybe they're working in the communications office or the business office. And so, um, or maybe they might even be working in an archdiocesan or diocesan role leading schools. Um, and we are open to that as well in terms of applications. And then the last thing is just a willingness to commit at least five years to Catholic education. Um, and the reason being is that we see this formation opportunity as truly us investing in you, but also investing in your school community. And given that, we want to be sure that we're offering support um, to those that are going to, in return, really commit themselves to Catholic education. While it is probably likely that you have already made that commitment, it's important for us to share um, because we do want to be sure that we're supporting people that are going to remain committed to Catholic schools and Catholic school leadership. It's also important to us just given the way that we have approached our program cost. So the University of Notre Dame and the REMIC Leadership Program, um, we're both committed to ensuring that we reduce any barriers that make graduate studies a financial challenge. And so we want to uh, be fully transparent with you, but also help you uh, really navigate when you're thinking about how am I going to pay for this program? So when we think about our program, we start first with just the total program cost. So total program cost is $54,024. And that's for the 25 months that includes tuition, that includes room and board when you are here on campus. We have offered a scholarship to every single REMIC leader who's accepted, which immediately brings that cost down to $27,024. And what we ask REMIC leaders to do is with that $27,024, they are going to, you can reach out to your um, diocese, you can reach out to your school, you can reach out to your parish and see if there is any funding available for those that want to go in and continue their education. We also ask you to consider what you can uh, sacrifice individually yourself as you consider all the different ways that uh, you're trying to you know, cover cost. And then we ask you to come back and say, based on what I know I have either secured and, and recognizing that some diocese and archdiocese, some schools may not be able to support. And we understand that, we're aware of that. Um, and for you to then come back and say, what is this? This is my remaining need. And then it is our goal to ensure that we meet that need. Um, and we really mean that. And I think that's one thing that individuals, uh, as they're applying, um, are a bit more hesitant because they see the number. And we want to share the number with you because if your archdiocese or diocese or your school is one committed, but also able to provide funding, we want you to utilize that. If your archdiocese or diocese or school are not able to, we want to be sure we know that too. And to ensure that we can really be truthful and transparent and honest with one another, our entire application process is entirely need blind. So we will not um, ask for any sort of financial need until after you've been accepted. And we do that to make sure that we're able to meet the need, but also so that you know how committed we are to meeting that need. All incoming REMIC leaders who requested additional support 
receive additional financial support. No one has had to turn us down due to financial need. And so please know that this process is one um, that we take really seriously um, because we know that when someone is committed to becoming a Catholic school leader, uh, we want to support that. That's why we exist. But we also want to be sure that we're transparent in why things like the five-year commitment or you, you know, reaching out to your superintendent um, is really helpful. And so we will walk, um, once accepted, walk you through that process, but we would encourage you now, if you haven't talked to someone within your school, your diocese or archdiocese to find out if there's funding available, it would be a really great time for you to start asking um, the moment that you start applying, um, just to kind of get a sense of what kind of the state of uh, affairs are, if you will, in that space too. We wanted uh, to, of course, uh, leave some time for questions here, uh, recognizing we will have a webinar next Thursday, um, all about walking through that application process. Um, but we'll, I will go ahead and stop sharing my screen right now, and we'll take some of your questions, and Rachel will share those with us. Thanks, April. So our first question is during the school year, fall and spring, are the online courses self-paced via Zoom? What does that schedule look like? And how do we take into consideration that they're working educators? That is a great question. Um, we, the best way to describe it in words that I, I would say a few years ago would not have caused like um, some anxiety is the word asynchronous. But it's the best word to use here. It is primarily asynchronous. So to put it in a perspective, um, our first year cohort right now, uh, I, I met with two people about their internship plan today. One of them was eating her lunch and the other person was already home for the day. And so we have um, a time zone uh just to take into consideration. So most of the work is done asynchronously. Um, this week in particular, one of our first year courses had two uh, options for uh, a Zoom class that they were doing. And given that they try to always, and we always try to offer if we are um, expecting you to attend something in the evenings that we offer two time slots um, to make sure to accommodate time zones. But it is primarily done asynchronously, which is helpful. Um, it's also one of the things that I know our REMIC leaders um, sometimes struggle with after being together for the summer for four weeks where you're in class together every day and you walk together every day. And then that time away um, and the way people manage it is really differently. We have some people who um, really try to take when it comes to their REMIC work protecting some time on the weekend. Um, for others, it's I'm going to protect some time after school every day. Um, for others that they've shared, I have to protect time once my kids go to bed. And that's kind of my protected time in the evening. Um, and everyone approaches that work differently. But our goal is to do uh, things that are going to continue to help Remic leaders grow. We want, that's, we said rigorous academic preparation and we meant that. But also the second to make sure that it's never anything that you know, is is unnecessary or isn't going to help you or your school improve. And so we're not uh, a type of program where it's like you're going to, you know, read a bunch by yourself and then you're going to kind of have to figure it out on your own. Um, that's not the style of who we are. Um, and we're really intentional about the work that we ask our REMIC leaders to do during the school year. Um, but also making sure that we're accommodating um, to the fact that you're across multiple time zones. And we all know that you're not only working a full-time job, you're also a full-time person uh, to friends and family and loved ones and people that you care for. And so that's just something that we uh, continue to balance here as a faculty as well. The next question is asking if our program can help um, someone get an administrative license. So that is a great question. Um, every state is different. Um, we have someone here in our um, offices that can help navigate and helps navigate that for any REMIC leader. Um, one thing to just kind of keep in mind, um, the way that it works is every uh, REMIC leader will uh, take a licensure exam at the end of their time in the program. If they have a uh, clear credential or a teaching license um, already in another state, they will then be able to seek licensure here in Indiana. And so what happens is if you have that teaching license and it is not expired, it is clear, and you also will pass that, uh, that exam here, um, and I'm saying you will uh, in confidence, 
Um, you can then seek licensure in Indiana first as a building level leader, and then you can seek reciprocity in your state. As of right now, there is only one state that takes uh, a couple more steps. If you happen to be in Minnesota, that takes a couple more steps, but we will happily navigate that with you um, here in our office. Um, and it's, you know, the majority of our REMIC leaders don't all come from the state of Indiana, although some do. And so the reciprocity um, is a relatively easy process as long as um, from the start, you know, you work with our licensing office. If you are not yet licensed, um, you are still eligible to apply to REMIC, and th that just requires some additional steps on your end if you are going to be seeking licensure at the end of our program. Um, we have some people that, for whatever reason, don't have a traditional teaching background. Um, like I was mentioning before, maybe you're working in the communications department or you're the CFO of a diocese, uh, you may not be the one that would have a teaching license. Um, you're still welcome to apply, and we will still give the same rigorous academic preparation should you ever in the future want to seek licensure as well. Great question. Um, so this question is related to the summer. Um, specifically, are they like many semesters, meaning do you take a few classes, final exams? I think just talking a little bit about the structure. Great uh, attention of the glories of higher ed and what we probably all experienced in an undergrad. And so throughout the time that you are here in the summer, um, your schedule stays relatively the same. Um, you'll take three to four classes. Um, you are together with your cohort. Um, and so uh, an example from this summer is um, they would wake up, they'd go to have breakfast, um, class begins at eight. And they would have um, one class, then they would have um, an integrated leadership class that was a little shorter, have lunch, then another class, then another class, and then went till about 5.50, 5.55, have dinner uh, with your cohort together, study, uh, do whatever needs to happen for the to get prepared for the next day, go to bed, wake up, do it all over again. Um, and so the summer experience um, is really meant to be one um, that again, that learning happens in community. And so you are together to take those courses, um, but it's usually about three to four courses um, over the course of the summer. Um, and then during the academic year, um, you take three courses online as well. I'm just searching too. We have a course sequence that's on our website that can walk you through like the credit hours that you take for each semester. But in the summer, the first two summers, you do knock out about 10 credit hours um, each summer. So it is a pretty intensive four week period, but you are knocking out a lot of credit hours in that short amount of time so that you do have your full academic year, not free, but a much lighter load. Um, so that is much more helpful. So I'll link that in the chat um, when I find it. But if you also, if you have it as a plug for our website, we do have a number of um, a number of resources on our website that talk about the program, um, our values, mission, um, some great uh, videos of our REMIC leaders sharing their experiences. Um, so if you haven't had a chance to check that out, um, please do. Um, our next uh, question is, uh, is relating to financial aid. Um, so they're wondering um, if they need to look elsewhere for financial aid. When do people do that since the applications are due February 1st? Um, they just don't want to miss any deadlines for scholarships. Um, I'm happy to take a stab at, at this one too. And April, you can chime in. Um, so because I run our I run our scholarship process. I'm so happy to answer any of those questions. Um, I would say it is pretty um rare that you would need to look elsewhere if you haven't already, if that makes sense. So I would say that we typically do are able to meet almost all financial need that someone comes back with. Obviously, we want you to have those conversations about scholarships with your external partners. So your diocese, your parish um, prior to the application, because they will want to know you're applying. Um, and then once you're admitted, we can provide some additional documentation for you to take back with them specifically. And they'll be happy to have more of a serious kind of final conversation with you at that point. Um, so I would say that I understand that the timing looks tight, but all those conversations tend to happen pretty naturally um, just because we are close with many of the diocesan partners, um, many of the local schools that you may be applying from. Um, and so they may know about us already and understand the application and scholarship process. So um, we're happy to work with you as well. I do, we do ha always have some leaders that they're waiting to hear back from their diocese. So we're able to push some of those timelines out for them. Um, really, it is uh, we are here for you. Um, and so it really is an individual process and happy to be as flexible as we can. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I would just reiterate too that 
if you are in any way uh, concerned about, well, I don't really know my superintendent all that well, or I feel a little like awkward about it. The reality is that all you're doing is finding out if there's support, but more importantly is you're sharing, hi, my name is so-and-so. I work at this school. I'm really interested in being a Catholic school leader. And so to just know that even if they come back and say, we're not able to, you inform them about your interest in a way that is professional and uh, really being proactive about that. It's not often, um, and we know that, it's not often that somebody says, hi, I would like to be a Catholic school principal. And the reality is if we had more people, we wouldn't have so many openings and such a great need. But I, I've always really encouraged Remick leaders to see that as an opportunity to introduce yourself if you don't know your superintendent. If you are working in a school that is private, but under the auspices of you know your diocese, I would still highly recommend that you reach out to your superintendent. Um, they don't get really talked to in that type of way very often based on my experiences with them. And I know they would at least welcome your email to say, hi, my name is this. I work here. I'm applying to this program. I wondered if we had any financial support available. And uh, in worst case scenario, they know that you're interested. And, and I think that's just a really beneficial way to, to put your name out there also. This question is also related. They're asking about um, what is the average support a diocese provides. And I would say it varies greatly. Um, I do know that some dioceses have that documented in a handbook of some sorts, which documentation is always lovely and is great for you to reference. Sometimes it references they'll pay as a reimbursement or they'll pay a third or they'll pay, um, it truly varies. I would say that we will not say no to anything. So if your diocese say, says that they can provide $500 a semester or total even, that's wonderful. Um, so I would just open the conversation uh, saying what you what have you typically provided? Um, we're happy to have an individual conversation with you um, if you have questions about how to start those conversations or um, it's also helpful we have some kind of pre-prepared um, documents that show like the breakdown of other partnerships that we've had with diocese. So definitely something that I think most of them are willing to have those conversations. We understand that it is budgets are tough. Um, and so sometimes the answer is no, and that's also okay. But again, it's just so great that you're having those conversations, making those um, connections with your diocesan offices, um, or even just people in your school. So just know that we don't have a standard amount. Um, it looks completely different depending on the diocese. If it was so, if, it, if there was a standard number, I, that would make my life a lot easier. <laughs> um, but again, just about having those individual conversations and figuring out what works best. Um, so again, happy to answer any specifics. And it also, if you're wondering if we've worked with someone from your diocese previously, also a great question to ask because we may have a contact. We may know your diocese does this weird thing that's documented here that we can help you help you navigate. Uh, a question about housing during the summer, which is always a point of, which is always. Yeah, a, I'm going to tell you, um, we have. Um, a pretty, a pretty deep belief. And I think that that goes a couple of ways. One, um, we're founded by, you know, the University of Notre was founded by the Congregation of Holy Cross, um, who believe in community. Um, we here in the Alliance for Catholic Education, that is one of our pillars, is community. And in Remick, uh, we see that the same way. And so what happens in the summer is Remick leaders um, live in a dorm. Um, and so the dorm, uh, of course, uh, has... Um, Rooms that are either doubles, triples, um, or quads, meaning four people in a room. Um, for a fee, you can pay to have your own single room. There is a shared uh, community uh, kind of bathroom with, you know, individual showers and stalls um, on every single floor. Um, given the the structure of the way our you know, our summer experience goes, um, that community life is to us just as important as the time that you spend in class. Um, we really believe that every Remick leader um, and, and the support that they give to one another is just as important as the support that we're able to provide. And so Remick leaders live together, they eat together, they learn together. Um, and so most Remick leaders will, you know, live in the dorm. We have had situations, um, whether it's um, people who've applied who are part of religious orders that they must live, you know, whether it's a religious sister that must live in a convent, um, or if someone is local, some people have chosen to, 
live at home. Um, some people also who are local have continued to choose to live in the dorm just to have that separation as well in their time. And then um, we've also had REMIC leaders um, who have chosen to bring their families um, to campus over the four weeks and have rented a home nearby. Um, we don't offer uh, family housing in any way, but there are because we are part of the University of Dame who enjoys football. We have lots of rental properties. Um, and if that's the route where you're interested, um, we're happy to connect you with REMIC leaders who have lived that. Um, I can't speak from my own experience. Um, I came and I, I stayed. I was a REMIC leader. I stayed in the dorm the whole time. Um, but we'd be happy to, if you reach out to us, introduce you to people that have done it and it's worked beautifully for their family. Also people who have done it and would maybe never do it again because it just wasn't the best setup for their family. Um, but the majority of our REMIC leaders live in the dorms. Um, and as I said, there is a fee if you would choose to have a single room. Otherwise, um, they live in either doubles or triples or quads as well. So this um, perspective leader is asking uh, for just a quick overview of the application process, you know, recognizing that we'll review that next week in our other webinar. But if you could just give some highlights of that application process. Yeah, so I would say one thing um, when it comes to the application process, um, what we'll go over is actually walking through the application. One thing um, that, and I would say just like quick tips and advice, um, one is open the application. When that application opens, I would encourage you to open it if you're in any way interested. We see the application process as a true moment of discernment. At any point in time in the application process, you can say, I think I still feel really good about this. At any point in the application process, you might also say, I actually don't think this is set up to what I'm really looking for. And I think that's one step closer in terms of really discerning the program. And um, we have application instructions provided to you as well. And we encourage you to really follow those and, and walk through those. Um, one of the biggest missteps people take is opening the application and flying through it because they think I need to hit submit as soon as possible. And in fact, you're not, I think when you're thinking about this to really take it as a discernment opportunity and share, you know, whether it's essay questions or uh, the way that you might want to respond to something to really consider multiple perspectives. So if you haven't talked to your principal about applying, you need to talk to your principal about applying. Um, it's going to help you reshape um, your own words and what you're going to put on the paper. Um, if you haven't talked to your family about applying, talk to your family about applying um, and, and know that um, same thing with, you know, friends, professional colleagues. Um, I think those are just uh, important notes when we think about the process. There are really clear instructions, but nothing is going to take the place of you really embracing it as a discernment opportunity as well. Um, but the moment that application, you know, um, it's on Saturday. I did Saturday, right? Saturday. Yes. That was like October 1st, Saturday. Um, open it and start your account and know that that is just one step closer, but it's also just helpful to continue to kind of have that dialogue with yourself and others about your discernment. I think too, please know that April and I are here to help um, throughout the process as well. It's literally why we're here um, to help uh, prospective leaders walk through this process. Um, we're happy to answer any questions um, as we're doing tonight, but as you decide if this is the right year, even for you to apply, we are very patient, very persistent. Um, so if you decide this isn't the right year, we're here um, to have those conversations with you. So just please use us as a resource um, as you do go through that process this year. Um, the next question is asking about what percentage of REMIC leaders accepted into the program will actually complete the program. I, I don't know if I have a clear percentage. I would say it is relatively close to 100% of people. Um, because we're, I, and I, it's not just us, it's you also, all of you who apply. I think that the discernment is so intentional and the process by which people decide whether or not we're a good fit says a lot already about their commitment to being a Catholic school leader. That's like beginning. The way that we think about formation and we the way and we think about a formation, you're and I, I know you have many options and we recognize that we are simply one option if you're seeking to become a Catholic school leader. We are one option. Our formation and our intentional investment in you as a person 
as you as part of a school community and as you as a future Catholic school leader really means so much to us that when we accept you, we accept you with the understanding you will complete the program. Will it be hard? And Rachel, you know, mentioned that earlier. Yes. Is it difficult to manage being a Remick leader and being a full-time employee of a Catholic school and being all the other things you are to all the other people? It is difficult. However, we have 500 plus people that have gone through that experience in various places in their life. We have people that are early career and might only right now need to worry about themselves and their dog or themselves and their partner. Um, We also have people that have gone through the program and over the course of the 25 months have gotten married, have had children, have had grandchildren, um, and so, and have cared for their own children. They've cared for parents, um, kind of, you know, I I think about just that, that different space of caring for small children, which can sometimes bring heaviness, but also caring for parents near the end of their lives, which brings its own heaviness. And so to just know that our range of Remick leaders in terms of experience is also quite large. Um, And so it's all entirely possible. Um, But yeah, I don't know. I was just like going on and on about my my love and desire to support every Remick leader, but we really mean it. And I think that's one, like, if there are two things you can walk away from this evening is financial aid should not be a concern. And if you are, and actually maybe that's the thing, if you are accepted, we will make sure that you are supported financially. And if you are accepted, our goal is to ensure that you graduate. Like that's just the reality. Um, the work that we do within our schools is too important to not have the right people leading them. And so um, we're just as committed across uh, our entire community here, but also know you have 500 plus ceramic leaders that are also cheering you on as well. This is a nitty gritty application question. Are we requiring the GRE? We are not requiring the GRE. Um, we went test optional. Um, I believe one of the one of the our first year probably right after our throughout COVID, um, and it's been a move that has happened across the country. I know that you'll probably know many other uh, universities that are now becoming test optional even for undergrad. Um, and so, if you have GRE scores and you want to submit them, you're welcome to. If you have GRE scores and you don't want to submit them, also fine. If you don't have GRE scores, please. By no means should you feel pressure to take the GRE. It really, when we say optional, it really is optional um, and not something we don't believe anyone's determined. Uh, their life future is based on a test score, and we really mean that. And so please know if you have scores and you'd like to submit them, you're welcome to, but by no means are they required. Um, another application question um, if someone has been out of school for a while, um, so this is the So yeah, they've been out of school for a while. How do we consider their application any differently than someone who is applying more recently? I think in some ways, um, and this would go for anyone, um, what you did in your undergrad and your graduate degree, whether it was five years ago or 15 years ago, um, simply gives us some evidence. But we're going to get so much more evidence from what you share in your application, what your recommendations letters share in your application. And so um, I, I think particularly over the last couple of years, um, maybe these last three years with, you know, all of you working through a school system and a school here amidst COVID, um, you've learned a ton that none of us were prepared for. And so please know um, whether it's five years or 10 years or 20 years since you've been in a classroom um, that we look no differently at that. We really want to get to know you. My The only caveat I would say, and we'll talk a little bit about the transcript process next week, um, if you are uh, going to be needing to look up for transcripts and finding those transcripts, that may just take a little extra work if you've been away from school for a while. But most schools have moved to a much more, um, I would say, online friendly format in terms of getting those transcripts. So we'll talk a little bit more about that next week. But I would not be um, rest assured. And I think the two often things that people will say is, I think I'm too young to do it. And I will say, we would encourage you to have three to five years of experience um, because the reality is that's what, you know, we feel is it's helpful for you to have some formation and foundation, but sometimes we'll often also get the question of, I think I might be too old. And I will say, that's not old. You're just wise. And you come in with a lot more experience, um, but we are very open to that. Just given that uh, if you're applying, we know that the desire is there for you to become a leader for sure. 
Yeah, I think our age range this year uh, in our the whole program is like 23 to 60. So it's a wide, wide range mm -hmm. of leaders. Uh, this is another follow-up question. Sorry about the application process. Um, clarifying about that third reference letter, if they haven't stayed in touch with their faculty members who we're looking for in that third reference. Yeah, so we put uh, intentionally, it's an academic reference, put in parentheses, some people you could ask. Professor is one. You could ask a mentor, two. You could ask um, a colleague. You're re we're really looking for, what do you like as a learner? Um, and that's the really the question we're asking. Um, so anyone who has seen you learn and grow, um, professors are great, but so are people that have been your mentors, um, colleagues that have worked with you on something that can really show us the space of what you're like as someone who's learning and growing. And I think that's the most important. That's why we label it as academic reference as opposed to professor reference. If someone, uh, do you have to stay at the same school for that five years that we're asking for? Or what happens if you want to move, uh, switch schools or even move states? Um, I'm sure your principal will say that they would love to keep you for all five years. Um, but the reality is um, two things. One, the need is great. We need more Catholic school leaders. And so we will often have REMIC leaders over the course of their 25 months walk in or step into leadership roles, whether at their own school or someone else's or rather not someone else's, but a new school. We also have just life circumstances. And so as long as you remain in Catholic schools, um, that is what the five-year commitment means. Um, REMIC leaders have moved because of, you know, their partner's jobs or, um, just life has changed or they all of a sudden have this amazing opportunity. Um, Rachel and I were just talking to a REMIC leader who really was not, I think, maybe necessarily thought like, this is where I'm going to be. This is where I'm going to be the school principal. I love my school. I know I'm already kind of walking into that space. And then a couple of months into her REMIC experience realized, no, that's not actually at all. And, and made a pretty big move across the country. Um, and again, the need is great, but also life happens. And so the five years do not have to be at your school. And in fact, most REMIC leaders um, will move into new roles at the end of the 25 months, but it's also not entirely rare for someone to move into a leadership role um, halfway through the program. We've also had people uh, get surprised, if you will, and do their summer with REMIC, return to their school site, and are now the interim principal for whatever reason. And so um, those steps into leadership really happen over the course of 25 months, sometimes after the 25 months, sometimes a smidge after that. But we don't expect any REMIC leader to necessarily stay at their, their current school site for five years. Yeah, I think we have four first-year principals in our second-year cohort right now who would not have told you they were going to be first-year principals in the next in the next couple of years. Right. Some even in any, one like and even in a new diocese who would not yeah. have ever thought. Yeah, so you just never know. Um, I think that's actually one of the other questions: is uh, this person that isn't necessarily planning on being the principal in the next like two or three years, but was thinking about it more as like a long-term goal? Is this still an appropriate program for her? I definitely feel it's an appropriate program. One one just consideration I would continue to to really push and 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 to have that dialogue with your current principal is if you don't see that happening in the next five years, like what active steps can you take to move to take on more leadership roles? Um, and that that's just because um, a hesitation I think often is I love the classroom so much, and I know I want to be a principal in five years, and it's like okay, well then we want to think like. How can I take that love I have for student learning and maybe start pushing it to ways that I can learn to love adult learning and maybe lead some adult learning within your building as a, as a teacher leader? If you're already in a teacher leader role, great. Continue to build up that area. But if you are thinking that might be more of a five-year plan, um, what active steps are you taking to move forward? And maybe this is one of them. Maybe you hadn't really uh, considered, you know, really active formation in school leadership, but that would just be a push I would encourage uh, to continue to think, how can I grow so that the 25 months in REMIC um, are really both ones that I'm getting formation through the University of Notre Dame, but I'm also getting formation and support at my school site as well. Oh, I think you're muted. Great, does anyone have any more questions? You guys were a wonderful group tonight.
I always feel joyful when I'm like, I keep it on my toes a little bit here. <laughs> Great. Well, again, we are happy to be a resource throughout this entire process. Should you have questions about the program or the application process, we look forward to hopefully seeing many of you next week. And like I said previously, our recording will be on our website within the next couple of days. So please check back for that. Great. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you again. Thank you all. God bless.